God's grace, mercy, peace and love be with you today as we uh, gather today uh, for our meditation today, as I mentioned earlier, from the uh, gospel assigned for this particular Sunday from uh, Matthew chapter 22. Uh, and uh, there's two parts to this reading, by the way, uh, in Matthew 22. And uh, we've got the slightly shorter version there, um, but I also want to read just a little fraction more in relation to that. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God, and with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments, hang all the law and prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And no one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. We pray. Gracious Lord Jesus, as you bring us together in worship, we do thank and praise you that we are called God's children in the grace of baptism. As you bring us together this day, Lord, and reflect on this word you've given us through your Son and in the life of the church this day, we pray, sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. As we begin our meditation today, and there was a question in the Gospel, by the way, that relates to this as well, too. I want to begin, and I've reflected on this question in the past, the question of identity. Who am I? If you had to describe yourself to someone else, uh, what would you say about yourself? And in that gospel, Jesus effectively asked that question when he asked, uh, what do you think of the Messiah? He was really saying, who am I in this question? So if you had to describe yourself to someone or ask someone to describe you to someone else, what do you think they would say? Now we know that the question of identity, self-identity, self-concept, self-worth, self-esteem is actually very multi-layered uh, and it's not without reason uh, that there are many people today uh, in that whole uh, field of psychology uh, working with people as they work through various issues because usually behind this we're reflecting on that question of self-identity or self-esteem or self-worth or the like. Uh, as well. And we know that we are a product of our biology, our DNA, our family of origins, uh, and personality in some way is shaped by that. We also know that we are a product of our environment. Uh, you know, the food you eat, the people you encounter, the schools you go to, all these sorts of things shape who you are, the people you marry, where you go, where you live, and so on. And so we are also a product of our experiences. And of course, this is very, very multi-layered. And um, you know, when we're born a little child, uh, we just have this, well, I'm here, look at me. And then as we get older, we ask this question, well, who am I? And we try and encourage people, of course, to be what God wants them to be. Now one person in reflecting on this question of who am I has just written this little thing. Who am I, you ask? I am made from all the people I've encountered and all the things I have experienced. Inside I hold the laughter of my friends, the argument with my parents, the chattering of young children, the warmth from kind strangers. Inside there are scratchings from cracked hearts, bitter words from heated arguments, music that gets me through and emotions I cannot convey. I am made from all these peoples and moments, that is who I am. And of course we can reflect on this question of who am I in so many different ways. 
and maybe later is if you choose to reflect on this sermon. You can reflect on this question, if I had to describe myself or describe you to someone else, what would I say? Now, the reason as I'm picking this up is as we commemorate the Reformation today, of course, we're asking this question of our identity. What's a Lutheran? And how would you describe what is a Lutheran to someone else? And I've got a simple collage of some pictures there. You know, we can look at our badges or our symbols that we hang everywhere um, in our Lutheran Church of Australia. There is a particular symbol that has meaning. Uh, it's been added to uh, with sayings like where love comes to life and the like. And of course, we can go back to Luther's Rose, which is deep and rich in symbolism. As we think about what is a Lutheran about, we can think about our theology, our confessions, our beliefs, and that little statement there about grace alone and faith alone and Christ alone and Chris, um, scripture alone and to God the glory alone. So you've got all of these alones that are together with something else. Do you always find that just a little bit amusing uh, as well? Uh, but it, is, uh, you know, it, it points to a deep tradition of theology. We can look at our history Martin Luther uh, and what happened at the time of the Reformation, can't we? What's a Lutheran? Well, obviously there's Luther in there, isn't there? Uh, and as we dig into that, we can also look at the incredible lay people who surrounded Luther. Uh, and of course, we're thinking particularly of Philip Melanchthon, who was very, very important in the writing of the Confessions. We can look at the history of the Lutheran Church, uh, which also extended to its institutions. Uh, our bishop uh, likes to tell the story of Pastor Theodore Fliedner and the institution of Kaiserwerth on the Rhine. Now, most of you probably don't know of um, Theodore Fliedner, do you? Uh, and he, he worked with, in a mission setting with deaconesses and they cared for people in need. And they had this very significant person who was pondering on the, the care of people and she spent four months in Germany uh, reflecting on care. Her name was Florence Nightingale. And most people have heard of Florence Nightingale and she said that that was a defining moment in her life. She actually wrote uh, a, a treatise about that anonymously at the time because she was a woman and you know women in public at that stage uh, but she reflected on that from a statistical perspective. She was incredibly clever and of course she is known as this person of care. So what's a Lutheran? We've actually had this rich tradition of soul care, caring for people, uh, looking beyond behaviours and looking at the heart of people as well. And of course in Australia we can reflect on our history or tradition, can't we? You can play, playfully talk about Carvel and Fritsch, uh, those early uh, German pastors coming to Australia that created what is the, uh, the seeds of what we now call the Lutheran Church of Australia. We can look at uh, significant people throughout the history of our Lutheran Church and Alfred and Helga Zinbauer in Adelaide as the post-war migrants came to Adelaide and we can think of other places like at Bonagilla uh, when uh, those from Europe, coming from Europe, were settled here in Australia. And we can look at all of the institutions that surround us as church. What's a Lutheran? It's a, it's a question that could, yeah, you can have a long conversation about as well too. But as we reflect on this question, of course, and come to this day and the confessions of our church, uh, we would say that heart of being a Lutheran is the article of, on justification. It's the article number four in the Augsburg Confession. And really the Augsburg Confession is like the constitution of the Lutheran Church in terms of our beliefs. It's also, by the way, an excellent basis for doing a pastor's class. It's very logical in the way it's set out as well too. The article on justification. We further teach that we cannot obtain forgiveness of sins and righteousness before God through our own merit, work and satisfaction, but that we receive forgiveness of sins and become righteous before God by grace. For Christ's sake, through faith, when we believe that Christ has suffered for us and that for his sake our sins are forgiven us and righteousness and eternal life are given to us as gifts. For this faith is what God wishes to regard and impute as righteousness in his sight. And then they quote this Bible verse which succinctly puts it, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And it really, you know, when it comes to our identity as people and our identity as church, 
it hinges on God's incredible grace and love for us in Jesus. Now, when we come to the alternate gospel for today, uh, the one that's regularly assigned for today, that most Christians around the world will be listening to, by the way, uh, as well. Uh, some Lutheran churches might commemorate the Reformation next week, but uh, in most other uh, traditions that follow the lectionary, they'll be listening to that gospel reading uh, where Jesus spoke about love. And this is an incredible um, passage of scripture uh, as well, too, because this is where Jesus silenced effectively the Pharisees. They didn't ask him a question at this point. And of course, we know that this is in Holy Week, uh, just a few days before Jesus dies on the cross. And it's important to remember that these words, um, Jesus affirms them here in Holy Week. By the way, he spoke about them in his ministry earlier. Uh, and if you pick up Luke chapter 10, that's where love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength is uh, as well. That longer definition which we very often remember. But what's happening here? Well, Jesus has come to Jerusalem for a purpose, hasn't he? It's to be our saviour, to go the way of the cross. And as he's in the temple, uh, he is confronted by various factions within Judaism and they're questioning Jesus. They're trying to trap him and to trick him. And so uh, those Pharisees decided to test Jesus, we know that. What's the most important commandment? And of course, Jesus responded with God's word. Didn't come up with a clever saying. He went to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Deuteronomy 6, 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbour as yourself. And it's about rejoicing in love. By the way, um, those of you who read the devotion book may have already read the devotion. Sorry if you do it at night time and I give it away um, as well too. But there's a beautiful devotion uh, by the uh, author of the devotion today, um, uh, Lynn Bowman, and she reflects on this particular scripture passage. And she goes back to another beautiful word in uh, Psalm 37 verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's a beautiful word in the Psalms, by the way. And as he reflects on this, he said, talks about it in terms of delighting in the Lord. You see, the, the Pharisees, when they tested Jesus and Jesus responded to this word, they were thinking in terms of compliance. They were thinking in terms of behaviour. They were thinking in terms of what you must do. They're compliance orientated, behaviour orientated. And Jesus, he refers to this, and you can look at this in terms of words of compliance and behaviour, but he actually wanted to push them a little further. He said, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And that word hang, which sometimes is translated depends, is actually a very important word. And that's by the way, why Jesus goes into that word about who is the Messiah. You see, this word hang is only used a few times in Matthew's gospel, and one of those times has to do with hanging on the cross. It's the same word. These words, the law and the prophets, hang. And then he says, whose son is the Messiah? And he's really pointing to the cross. You see... When it comes to God's word at this point, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. All of us, if we honest with ourselves, can see where we fail daily, constantly. We're not perfect in our love towards God, and we're not perfect in our love toward our neighbour. And the Reformation really was about us remembering that it's about God's grace. You see, Luther's struggle when it came to God's love is, uh, the people, by the way, they didn't disbelieve that we're saved by grace through faith. But the argument was, what does it mean to be a good person in relation to that? And they understood it something like this. It was faith and works, that word and. So to show that you've got faith, you had to work. And those works were part of your salvation, faith and works. 
And Luther came to realise that there's not faith and works, but rather a faith that works. So instead of faith and works, it's a faith that works. Um, uh, he spoke of it like this, you know, if you've got that gift of faith, it's like a tree, it will naturally bear fruit. Um, but the, it's the tree that's given to you. you. You remain in the vine of Christ. It's a faith that works. And of course, we know that we stumble and fall, but that doesn't take away grace in any measure. It doesn't take away that gift of faith. You are no less of a person and no less of a Christian when you do stumble and fall. Rather, we constantly go back to the grace of God. Delight yourself in the Lord. The Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. And really this command of Jesus to love God and love neighbour. Yes, it leads to good works, but it's not about good works. It's about delighting yourself in the Lord. Rejoicing in the love that he has shown you in Jesus. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And for Luther and for many people today, that's the struggle. Am I good enough? Am I the sort of person God wants me to be? Am I comfortable in who I am and where I'm at and where I'm going? Am I there for other people in their journey of life? The Pharisees were about compliance and control. Jesus was about delighting in God and his love for us in Christ our Saviour. Be still and know that I am God, God says in his word. As God's people, we can say that our ultimate goal for life is to love God with all our heart and soul and mind and to love others around us as we know God's love for us ourselves. And we are to be focused on our love of God. But this is not to be reduced to a formula, to a law of what you must do. On this day when we as Lutherans commemorate Reformation, we're celebrating along with all other Christians the love God has for us in Jesus our Saviour. Luther reasoned, God is holy and just. I am a poor, miserable sinner. No matter how hard I try, how can a holy God possibly love a sinner like me? And Luther tried everything to do uh, possible to earn mercy, love and forgiveness, but it was never enough. He was honest with himself. He didn't minimise his sin as if it made no difference to God. And Luther saw sin for what it was, something that separates us from God. And freedom came for him when he began to understand those words. We are made right with God, uh, apart from works of the law through faith. Who are you? Do you see yourself in the light of God's love? Do you see that the Lord delights over you and rejoices over you with singing? The more we bask in God's love in Jesus, and the more the reality of God's acceptance of us seeps into our hearts, the more we rejoice in God's love and indeed learn to love others as ourselves. What a joy it is to know this good news of that love God has shown us on the cross and by Christ's resurrection from the dead. And where our works and our loves fall short and we stand condemned, Jesus took that condemnation for us and demonstrates his love, his perfect and complete love for us, for you. That's our comfort, that's our joy, that's our strength in our journey of life. May the Holy Spirit keep you in this faith, now and always. Amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're going to continue our worship now with the song, How Deep the Father's Love.